Now we're going to talk about testing. So testing uh, any modern software development, this is a huge component of how you make programs is you test them, okay? Uh, because, I mean, as a human being, you make mistakes. And so the likelihood of your programming being correct the first time you write it is very, very, very small. And so we use testing as a way to improve the quality of our software. Um, so testing is built into Go. Go comes with a test framework. Uh, out of the box. And the way it works is pretty straightforward. We have, so what I did is I rewrote our program, our converters program. So we saw this before, and I made it in, a, in the converters package. So package converters. And then I created a convert function here. You give it the from and the to, and it returned a string and possibly an error. So if it didn't know how to convert it, or the number was invalid or something, it would return as an error. And what we want to do is to test this package. I want to create tests for this package. Uh, and the way we can do that is if we go to the folder where it's defined. So here's the converters folder. And I have converters.go. You create a file that has the same name, converters. And then you put underscore test.go. Okay? So I have converters.go and I have converters underscore test.go. And the way this works is you have a function that starts with the word test, with a capital T, and then it can just be test, or it can be test convert, which is what I'm gonna call it. But test something. Like I said, it can just be test. Uh, and then it takes one parameter, and that is usually done like this, t star testing dot t, okay? And this testing t, let's go look it up. So we go to testing. Testing is a package in Go. It provides support for automated testing of Go packages. It is intended to be used in concert with the Go test command, which automates execution of any function form. So what it does is it looks through those underscore test files and finds functions that have this style of name, test, and then replace XXX with whatever you want. And it's going to run those tests when you run Go test, okay? And so let's just make sure that that works the way we expect it to with this uh, T object, this T struct. So there's a B2, which we'll talk about in a second. So the, the T here has a bunch of methods we can use. Uh, you know, fatal, log. So let's just do log and see what happens when we run that. Log. Okay, so the way we run our test, now it's say import testing, is we say go test in that folder. So. <coughs> So I'm inside of that folder, converters, and I say go test. Pass, okay. It didn't print anything out. Now the reason it didn't print anything out is the way log works, is it only logs if something went wrong. So the way I can say that something went wrong is I can say t.fail, okay? And that signals to the test framework that something went wrong. And now we get our log that says hello world, and it gives us where it came from. Um, and so you use the log to indicate, to help you debug uh, test, tests that may have failed. So there's a lot of like philosophy around how to build tests, and it's something that takes a lot of practice to get good at. Um, in general, what you're trying to do is test the functionality of your program, but in such a way that it can adapt if you need to change your program in the future. Uh, and so you only want to test the parts that are, that are your logic, in other words. Um, and so in our convert function, there's sort of different ways we could approach this. Um, I guess what I'm saying is you don't need to test that multiplication works. You can take that for granted, okay? You need to test that this function does what you expect it to do, okay? And so an example of a test we might write would be I want to convert um, from miles to kilometers, and I want to check that that works the way I expect it to. And so we might say, uh, so I want to convert 50 miles to kilometers. Now remember, this is the format we define when we wrote the distance converter. It just takes the number and then the unit and then the two unit. And this is going to return a string and possibly an error. And the way we write tests in Go is they're just regular code. So we say, if error is not nil, then I'm going to fail, right? 
And the reason I'm going to fail is because error should not be nil, uh, should not, sorry, should be nil, and it wasn't, okay? Why should it be nil? Because this is a valid conversion. Our program should be able to handle this. If it doesn't handle this, there's something wrong with our code. So that's why I'm saying if there was an error, that's a problem, okay? And then the way you check to make sure that the value it returns is what we expect it to, we just use equal, so, right? Whatever it's supposed to equal. So if it's not equal to that, then we also have an error, right? We might say should be and then the value, but got, and we can see what we got, okay? So let me run this real quick. So it says error should be question, 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 but I got 80.47, right? And is that what we expect? Let's, let's just Google it, right? If I say 50 mile to km, I expect, uh, yeah, 80.47 is what I expect. So we replace that with 80.47, whoops, sorry. Right? And I expect it to be with the km. So that indicates an error with our program because it's not adding the km. So it said it should be 80.47 km, but it only got 80.47. So I need to add the km to the end, right? So I might go into the code and, and just, uh, you know, I might say, uh, let's just say string. And then, well, actually, it should just be two, shouldn't it? So. That's easy. I just say percent %s here and put 2. And now it should fix our program. Okay? Let's see. Did I type something wrong or something? New line. Ah, good catch. <coughs> that threw me off. But maybe it shouldn't have the new line. Maybe that's a bug, right? That seems, maybe, maybe this shouldn't be here. Uh, so, but you get the idea is that, is that uh, in general, sometimes it's a good approach to, you, you have the requirements, you know what your program's supposed to do. Perhaps you should write some of your tests first and then write the code for your program, right? And so your test will define the functionality of the program. And then as you write the code, you can start to make sure that it works properly. So we could continue writing various tests for this, you know, all the types. Like I could do different miles, I could do kilometers to miles, I could do etc. Uh, one thing to make that easier is what's called table-driven tests. And table-driven tests are a very common pattern in Go programs. Um, and the idea is that, so in other words, I might, I might have to repeat this multiple times, right? I'd have to, you know, do this again and again and again, and it might get kind of tedious to write all that. Uh, and so instead, what I can do is define a special struct for all the cases, right? So I have my input, my two unit, and my expected output. Make a big list of those, and then try each one, okay? And so you might say cases, colon equal. Um, so let's say we had from, to, and uh, expected. Those are all strings. And then, so this is, this is an interesting thing about the way to go, uh, these initializers work, is that it makes it really easy to build things because you can leave out all the types. So I can say 50 mi km 80.47 km, okay? And now what we're gonna do is loop over it. And then we're going to go through the same process, except now I just replace these with from and to. So c dot from c dot to. And now it's really easy for me to add another case, right? I just copy this and paste it, and now let's say 50 kilometers to miles, you know, and I just go ask Google, 
50 kilometers to miles should equal that. The decimal bit isn't. Except it'd be 07 miles. Okay. Right? Everybody following what I'm doing here? Um, and so let's see if that works. Totally it passes. Okay. And, and sometimes it's a good idea to just, you know, make sure your tests are running the way you expect them to. So I just changed the value. Yeah. So it tells you what went wrong. And so you could imagine building uh, dozens of these cases, right? Uh, and, and so now the question is like, how many should you build? Well, you should, you should test each case. You should test that, uh, you know, miles, kilometers, kilometers, miles, and then all the other ones we have, inches and yards and whatever. Uh, you should have cases for all of them. Now, you don't necessarily need to do more than one. Uh, often with a program like this, it's good to check your uh, boundaries, right? So maybe zero miles. That might be an interesting case because what happens when it's zero? That might be worth testing. Um, what about a really big number? What about a really small number? Those kinds of things might be useful. But in general, that's the idea is that you just come up with your cases. Any questions about this? OK. Just maybe top of that over scratch is nice. Example. Thank you. OK, so um, what I just described, of, and now you have this question of, well, what, am I, what have I not tested? Uh, Go comes with a coverage tool, which will tell you uh, in your code how much, you, how much of your code is covered by a test somewhere. Um, and so if I, there's some docs on that. Um, So the way this works is you can say dash cover. That says 30% of your statements. And there's a way to generate a report to show you which ones are and aren't. So if we do that. Well, we'll do it this way because we want HTML. And then. Uh, Oh, sorry. I've got to run this first. And it will show you, highlight what you've tested and what you haven't. So I've tested this, these lines of code. In other words, these lines of code were hit by a test somewhere. And then, but notice I haven't covered these, right? It's pretty obvious the ones I haven't covered. Uh, and so you can see in your code what is and is not tested. Uh, so that's a handy tool. What's the code behind that package? The coverage tool? Yeah. Holy smokes. Um, I can cover any. I guess we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's written in Go. That's, that's extensive. Good. That's an all-encompassing kind of thing. No, it's very powerful. And this is other programming languages have similar tools. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's very powerful what it can do. But basically, it's like running the code in the test and seeing, instrumenting what has been tested and what hasn't. So. Uh, very useful uh, tool uh, to, to see how, you know, 30% is not a great number. Um, now, I should say 100% is probably not a great number either, okay? And that's counterintuitive. People are like, oh, you should have 100% test coverage. It's like, yeah, but that means your code is like really hard to change now because you have so many tests. So you change one thing and half your code breaks, right? Half your tests break. Even though you haven't actually broken anything, it's because you have so many tests that you're you're covering things that are really not essential to the working of your program. Um, so sometimes it's not a good idea to have 100% test coverage. But maybe in the 90s it's a good idea, okay? Um, does everybody understand that? Okay. Uh, so that's how we test a, a function. And so what I just showed you is kind of a unit testing approach to this. Did I, I put this in there, didn't I? Yeah, I got it. Um, and that's where we sort of test one function. And you might have a test for each function in your, in your code. And that's generally a unit testing, OK? Uh, and then now notice in Go, we tend to write a test for the function, not, not a function for each case. I don't have a separate function for this one and a separate for this one. We tend to like collapse them into one, one test function that tests that whole thing, OK? Uh, and often with test cases. Uh, so we build these big table, tables of cases. 
Um, instead of having, you know, tests convert miles to kilometers, tests convert kilometers to miles, tests convert, we don't tend to do that. But you can, you can it's just we don't tend to do that. Um, so, but this is the unit testing approach, right? Now, on the other side, sort of on the very far end of the other side would be an integration test, okay? An integration test tests the system as a whole. So if you imagine you're making a, a web server, right? Now, one way we can test a web server is that my web server has lots of functionality like this in it. I'm calling convert somewhere inside of it. And so I test those functions. And once I've tested all of my functions, uh, presumably by combining them all together, I've sort of tested all the components in isolation. And by putting them together, it should still work, okay? The reverse is, why don't I test the final thing? And by testing the final thing, I will ensure that I have tested the pieces that make up it, right? And so the idea is that with an integration test, I might literally click buttons on a website, okay? And that test that, oh, it takes me to the right page, or it shows the right text in HTML, okay? So that would be an integration test, right? And this is the unit test word. You can do either and go, okay? Uh, and, the way, and the way you might do that is that uh, you might literally start a web server in here, literally make requests. Like, you can, you can actually do that if you want. Um, and so I think it kind of depends on the kind of program you're writing, which you should opt for. Uh, these tend to be better at the unit tests than integration tests. You're not going to have anything in here that makes it easy to click a button, for example. Uh, so you would have to write that, which might be really cumbersome. Um, as far as integration tests, people use a product called Selenium, and there's a bunch of others. People use PhantomJS, which is a Node.js tool, which emulates a browser as a terminal application, uh, which they can do because it's Node.js and it's JavaScript, so it's basically already there. Um, but there's other tools, too, that can do the more integration tests. But I think, in general, these get us pretty far. Okay. Does everybody understand that idea, that if I test the small components of my system in isolation, I can have a pretty, I can feel pretty good that when I put them together, they're going to work well, okay? Yeah? I imagine certain things are kind of difficult to test, so like, do you ever have to write a second order test? Yeah, so th this is where the art of learning how to write tests come in, is that you're absolutely right, some things are difficult to test, uh, because they might involve, uh, for example, suppose I'm using a database, and I want to test that my code works properly with the database. Does that mean I have to run a database to run my tests? And that's an example of, oh, that, <laughs> I don't want to have to do that. Uh, and there's some techniques, which I'll talk about, for how to, how to address that, okay? So those are our test strategies. Just think of them as a you know, unit on one side, integration on the other, and you're usually somewhere in the middle. Um, and sometimes you're both. A large company, you have a team devoted to testing, the quality assurance team, okay? And they will probably write tests over on this end of the scale. And in your own code, you might have tests on this end of the scale. Okay. Um, and so the strategy for uh, you sort of have stubbing and mocking. And the idea is that if I have a database, I can sort of emulate the calls to the database, make them return what I want, and then test my code. Because okay. I don't care if the database works or not. That's not my problem. My problem is the code I'm writing. So I can sort of stub out what the database does, make it return the data I want, and then test it against that, okay? And so the strategy here is that if you use uh, in stuff in Java or JavaScript, there are libraries which can replace, they can make it so that when I say a new database connection, it makes it a fake new database connection, okay? Go doesn't really have libraries like that, so you can probably write them. Instead, what it opts to do is to change the structure of your code slightly to make it more flexible. Let me give you an example. Um, so let's create a new folder here. I'll call it test example. And it's going to be a package. So we'll just say an example I go package uh, test example. Well, I can't really call it that, so I'll just call it example. It doesn't matter. Um, suppose I have something that takes a file. Okay? This is what I called my function. And it takes an os.file. Say it reads that file or does something with it, right? So I call, um, I call iloutil.readall on, on the file, okay? And I get back bytes and suppose it just returns the length of a file, okay? So we'll just do it that way. 
just be ignore the error, and we'll return link. Okay, so it's an inefficient way to get the length of a file, but just say that's how we, we did it. The point is that instead of having a, a sophisticated mocking framework that could make files become this magical object that you create, uh, what we do instead is a, a different strategy. So, actually I can use this to illustrate the differences between unit and integration too. So I'm gonna test, uh, what did I call this thing? Length of file. Okay. Um, so one way to test this would be to literally create a file. Right? So I can use, I think there's a write file, file util. And I can put it in slash temp slash fake file. And I can give it some bytes. Um, right? And then I think this is, oh, incidentally, earlier, uh, a, a while ago, several days ago, I said this was a hexadecimal. I was wrong. It's octal. That's the permission. It starts with a zero. It's octal, basically. Yeah. No X in there. So sorry. I gave you the wrong information before. Uh, and so this writes the file, and then I could test my length of file function and hand it uh, this file. Okay, so then I'd have to go F, air, you know, open, and then I give it this. Uh, and then I, you know, this is going to give me a length, and then if n not equal 5, you know, uh, Whatever. Um, and the point is that I'm testing this in sort of the integration way, which is I'm literally creating a file, literally calling the, the file function. Okay. So that's one way you can solve this problem. Everybody following what I'm doing here? Yeah, the integration way is kind of like, how, let's test it when it's actually running versus the, the what was the other one called? The unit unit testing. Unit testing is like, let's just check this one little unit and make sure it's working. Yeah, and so this is testing the function by creating a file and then calling the function on a file. Um, the downside of this is I had to create a file, and that's kind of expensive. That's like a costly operation. Uh, now, maybe it doesn't actually matter that much, but it's also something we have to keep in mind. I would probably need to delete this file, uh, so I probably need to, first of all, close it, and then call os.remove uh, on the file name, which is uh, like that. Um, and so that's kind of clunky. Uh, so a better option, can anybody think of a better way to do this? Take in a reader. Take in a reader. This doesn't need to be a file. Uh, sure, it says like the file, but we're not actually using anything specific to a file. All we're calling is read all. So, so really this could just be a reader, right? It could do exactly the same thing. Um, Except now the code's a little more flexible in what it can take in. By making it more flexible in what it can take in, it makes our tests way easier to write. Because now instead of having to go through this, I can write it like this. I can say um, strings.newreader, give it hello, and call it like that, okay? Does that make sense? So let me replace it so you can see it. Right. I don't have to create the file. Because really, I wasn't actually using a file. Uh, I was just doing it this way. So I, so I could just do it in this sort of one line. And it's doing, the test is exactly the same otherwise. It's just. So the point is, often, instead of using mocking or subbing and that kind of stuff, <laughs> make it so that whatever you're using can take in some sort of interface. And then you can change the definition of the interface when you write your tests, okay? So in the example of, I have something that uses a database, instead of taking the database object itself, um, suppose you have something like, so we have this struct, it might have a bunch of things in it, and it might have uh, a get method that returns a string or something, okay? Instead of taking the DB directly, take, you know, make a, make a, an interface that has a get method, okay, 
and use this guy instead of this guy in your code. Okay, and then you can create a special test object that implements this interface and pass that guy around for your test. And then you don't have to have a real connection to a database. You can have a fake one, and I can change the definition of this method so that now Git returns exactly what I want it to return. Okay, so that's that's, uh, that's clever. <laughs> um, awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, and that's just generally the approach to take with with testing and mocking is that use interfaces to do it. Okay, and yeah, that's all I've done here. I changed the file, a concrete thing, into an interface. That really helps when you see the, the power of interfaces. So on line 10, you change the pointer to capital DB to pointer database. No. No? And that's the method for that particular implementation of the interface. Yeah, maybe, maybe I should give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so, I guess I have, my question is, how is that not testing the interface as opposed to testing the date? I'll, I'll show you an example. Yeah, so, so let's say we have git name, it takes in a database, okay, and it returns a string. And the intention of git name is to return the user's first and last name combined together. So it's supposed to do something like db.git first name plus space plus db.git last name, okay? What I'm saying is one could have taken a star db here and implemented it that way. Um, well, let me give you the stub here. Uh, return Just John Doe, right? Okay. So imagine that was actually in the database. Um, I could have passed in star db into this. But had I done so, it would have made me make the test a little harder. But because now I take database, I can in my test, uh, this should be a string. I can inside of my test here. I say get name, I can create something that implements this. So I can say type fake database, and probably what I would do is have it like this. Uh, I'd say get is a function that returns a string, and then I'd say I'd make a fake database like this. And um, so I'd have to provide a, a method, right? So it's fake star fake database. Get a key string string and return fake dot get. Um, can't do it this way. <laughs> uh, And then in here, I would provide the definition, right? And so I'd say something like, uh, is a function that takes, and just say returns, uh, returns the key it was passed. Okay. And then when I say get name, I can test that, uh, you know, if result not equal, and it should be uh, first name, last name, okay? And so I've sort of, I've provided the definition of what a database could be right here. So instead of calling the database, it calls this function and returns just what you passed in, and then I just check to make sure it gives me what I expect, okay? Is everybody following what I'm trying to do here? So instead, basically the point is that fake database implements the database interface. It's a fake thing I put in my test just so that I can use it for testing. And this is generally how you, you stub out or mock out uh, objects in your code, is that you change your code to take interfaces, and then you provide fake 
implementations for just for testing. And this way, you know, your code that normally goes through the database and comes back out, now it goes through your just your test stuff and skips the database entirely. Okay? Uh, and this way you don't have to have a database set up on your testing machine. And it also makes your test way, 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 way faster. Okay? That's the idea. Uh, but like I said, this is the, the unit testing approach. On more of the integration side, you might say, well, mostly what I'm doing is writing SQL statements in my code. And so I really would like to hit the database because I want to make sure it actually does work. Okay. And then maybe you should use a real database. Question? So you are actually testing the interface, the connection between the source of the data, which is the database, and your code. Yeah, right. we're, we're testing, in this case, what we're trying to test is that I have implemented the, well, first I, I call the get method. That's one thing I'm testing. The second is that I have constructed it properly. Okay? But what I'm not so interested in is that the database, if I ask it for the right piece of data, it gives me back the right data. That's their problem, not mine. And that's what we're trying to avoid is having to actually hit the database and do that. But like I said, sometimes there's subtleties there. Uh, if a lot of databases, the way you query a database can be very complicated. Uh, and so, you know, you end up with a really big string with a lot of select star from stuff. And then maybe you really do want to hit database because the way it behaves is important to your program. Exactly. And so maybe it is worth having a real test, okay? But this is to scale one way to the other and you, there's trade-offs in both. And like I said, it just requires a lot of practice to know when to do one or the other. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Can you put that on the screen? Yeah. So benchmarks. So we testing is trying to figure out whether your code is working. Um, but sometimes you're not so interested in whether or not it works as uh, how fast it goes, right? So sometimes you have uh, performance constraints on your code, and benchmarks can give you a sense of of that. They can tell you if something's going fast or not. Um, okay, let's just get rid of all this. Let's make a, a really dumb function that just adds two numbers. Okay, so it takes in x and y, both ints, and returns an int, and returns x plus y. And we want to benchmark this function, okay? All it does is add two integers. Uh, and the way you do that is you, just like we did with test, you say benchmark, I think it's benchmark. Now I'm second guessing myself. Um, but it's described in the testing yeah, benchmark xxx. So you, uh, let's say benchmark add, and then it takes a b star testing dot d. It's kind of funny that these are short little names. But, um, and the way you do it, and they have an example here, is this b has an n field, which is the number of times to do something. And basically the idea is that almost everything you do on your computer is so fast that it's really hard to test to benchmark. Right, because you do it just once and it takes 280 nanoseconds, which is nothing. It's such an insignificant amount of time that the, the sort of trivial delays involved in a program overcome it immediately. So instead what we do is we run the program lots and lots of times, and then we average it out. Okay? And so in this case it was running in, what is this, 10 million times to, to find out that it took about 280 nanoseconds on average. Right? And so we use that. So basically, in a benchmark, you have this outer loop. And inside, you do your code. Okay? So let's say I want to add 1 and 1. Okay? And this will tell me how quickly uh, I can add those two numbers. Okay? So we say go test dash bench. And then you give it a regular we, uh, expression. Do you like a little pool, a little betting? Of how fast? I have no idea how fast it is. Um, wait, am I in the right? I'm in the wrong folder. I was like, this isn't working. Uh, so dash bench, and then you give it dot star. Um, there we go. 
<laughs> wow. Not even one nanosecond. Look at that. Oh, there you go. Try it. Wow. Your computer would be adding up was really fast. <laughs> uh, so, that's pretty funny. You, you could try it like 20 trillion times. Is that what it says? Yeah, something like that. And like ran that to get the average 20 trillion times. Uh, Computer can add quickly. <laughs> uh, that's one trillion less than the Chinese stock market lost, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, so yeah, normally of course you'd have a real function in here that like did more than this, and then we'd get more useful information. Um, but this is how you can benchmark your functions, and basically the the approach here is going to be that um, you you discover in your code that there's maybe a part of it that's kind of slow, and so you want to. There's a law about optimization of programs, right? And that optimization is sort of the root of all evil. Okay. And so basically, optimization is something you do when you have to, but otherwise you try to avoid it. Because optimization makes your programs harder to read. Um, and so, let me give you an example. Harder to read or harder to edit? Harder to Both. read as a human? Yeah. Harder to read as a computer? As a human. A computer doesn't care. Um, and there's all kinds of tricks you can do to make programs faster. Uh, I'm trying to think of one that I can easily show, but unfortunately, it's kind of hard to show because not using interface. Yeah, that that would be an example. If I had a interface here, um, that, well, okay, we'll do it this way, and then. If I'm adding them up, it's called x. Total plus equals x, and then return total. Total. Uh, what am I missing? There we go. Um, right, and then I'm casting it to an in. So suppose I had you know this in JSON or something, and I built this guy up. And so we can run that benchmark. Um, yeah, a lot slower, right? 410 nanoseconds. And if I change this to be so, this was the old way. I, I discovered this code. And I'm like, oh, I can improve this. And so you know, I comment this out. Um, well, let me copy it first, and then I'm going to rewrite it so it uses int instead of interface. And then I can get rid of this bit here. And then maybe I run it again. Yeah, see that? That is a huge improvement. It went from 410 to 8. That's the idea. It, it did more tests, too. Yeah, because it has to. It has to increase it until it actually takes some amount of time. Otherwise, it's not statistically relevant or whatever. Uh, so. That's the idea, is that you find a part of your program that's maybe eating up tons of, tons of time, it's a slow part of your program, and then you just go optimize that one small part, and you can use the benchmarking to get you there, okay? So you ran, uh, show the code again? So before... Show the code, and for that code to get a benchmark, you just, what was the command you ran, command line? Oh, yeah, yeah, go test, and then you give it dash bench. Go test, dash bench, so you can run that on any code, and it'll give you, it'll give you a match. You have to create benchmarks. Oh, you yeah. do? Yeah. Where are the benchmarks in the code there? They're in the test. We create oh, a benchmark. Right there. Right. Make sense? So how is the interface playing out? Because add was the function on the previous Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's no magic here. You just call you just call whatever you want to call in here. Yeah. And it does it. Um, right. So you don't necessarily have to benchmark a function. You can just benchmark Go code in here. Um, but the, yeah. The, the point is that it gives you this tool to make benchmarking easy, okay? Um, so those are the two ends of sort of testing. There's testing, oh, I got to make sure it's correct, which is more important. And then there's testing, oh, it needs to perform at a certain speed, okay? Like, I need this thing to take some number of milliseconds. And if it takes a lot, then I'm just doing something wrong, okay? Um, Would it be a false assumption that if my components of my program all run optimally, let's say, and I'm testing them and they're as quick as I can get them, that when they come together, I'm to assume that they're going to 
still stay that we still be optimized once they're put together, or that something could? Um, so I think in general, uh, like I said, you don't want to do premature optimization. And so if you write code that's kind of sensible and not just crazy, uh, so you're just generally writing okay, decent code, that's probably good enough. And then occasionally what you'll discover is your program maybe is running slow for some reason. It's at that stage you try to do the optimization. And the way you do that is you use what's called profiling. And Go does have some profiling tools, which I don't, I mean, I don't really want to get into too much. But basically they can tell you what part of your program is taking so long. It'll give you a function name, and then you can use this benchmarking to fix that function and make it faster, okay? Because in general, what you'll see is in, in profiles of programs is that one function will dominate the performance of the program. Like it'll take up 98% of the time to spend in this one function. So if you can make really nice, easy to read code for your whole code base, and then just make, sort of have not quite as nice, ugly code for that one function to make it fast, you will dramatically improve the performance of your code without making everything look nuts. Okay, that's the idea. Um, How often is it possible to improve the function? Oh, it's, it's challenging. Some things are fairly easy to fix, like we just saw here. Uh, you know, oh, boxing is expensive, so I change it to not be boxed by using the int, and then make it faster. But a lot of times they'll hit things that are not. And actually, if we want to go on this tangent, you guys asked, so uh, there is a tool at your uh, disposal that is uh, one layer below this. Can anybody guess what I'm about to show them? Okay. So this is kind of odd. Here's a function defining absolute, and it has no definition. But it does have this absolute with a lowercase a. So let's go up to math here. Ah, what are these S files? These are assembly. So if your program is really slow and there's nothing you can do in Go, you could always write your code in assembly and manually make it faster. I'm not recommending this, I'm just saying it's possible. Uh, so that's the deep, and most of the things in math are implemented this way for that very reason. Uh, because they can be done very efficiently. Uh, your CPU has specialized instructions for many of them. And so they've implemented them in assembly to make them go as fast as possible. So anyway, but there's pretty much no room for that because almost all of that has already been done in the standard libraries. Uh, but I, I don't know. It's usually things like this that you can fix. Any other questions about that? OK. Uh, I'll show you two more things because they're kind of fun. So one is Go Convey. So here's a package that these Marty Street people made. And it's a great uh, little tool. So the way you install it is you do Go Get in this guy. So Go Convey, all one word, is the name of it if you want to look it up. And you install it. And it's just like uh, Go Test. So I run Go Convey. And what it does is it starts up a web server. And I can hit it here. And it has this nice little UI for testing. And anytime I make a change to my file, so if I change, uh, you know, I, I add a function. Uh, it reruns a test, so automatically detects the change to the file, reruns all the tests, and so it's a, be a very quick process for uh, for testing. So handy tool. You can even enable desktop notifications, uh, so that when I save, <laughs> it's kind of cool, right? Uh, probably completely unnecessary, but you could do that, right? That's cool. Um, so I like this tool, it's kind of fun. There's, there's a bunch of other testing things out there, automatic testers and stuff, because people don't like to hit up and hit enter again. They want to just do it automatically, and that's, that's kind of, these tools can do that for you. So that's Go Convey. Any questions about that? Um, they also have a library for writing tests, but I, you can use it if you want, but I don't care for it. Um, I just use it to run the test. Um, and then the last thing here, was a race detector. So Go includes uh, a thing that can detect whether or not your code has uh, 
uh, things that are not thread safe in them. Um, yeah, yeah, that's not that. Well, <laughs> uh, Let me let me show you an example. Uh, because this is why multi-threaded programming is so hard. And so, race example, race like running a race, that's what this is. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we have package, I mean, it doesn't matter what this is. Well, I'll just call it. Uh, and then we have a function, uh, which is called f. And what we'll have is a state here, and we'll start a function, and we'll set it, and then we'll like print it out, okay? This, this code is bad. Why is this code bad? The reason this code is bad is we're both modifying x and using it at the same time, potentially. Weird stuff happens when you do this, okay? That's, that's the call. Uh, the behavior depends on who happens first, and it's not really well defined. And so that's why it's a race, it's a data race to see who gets there first, and weird things happen. Okay, so this code is bad, and you're allowed to write it in Go. Go doesn't prevent you from writing it. And so basically the problem is we're sharing state between two Go routines. That's fine if we're only reading the state, it's bad if we're modifying the state. Okay? And so Go includes a race detector to detect this happening. So let's Google that. I always forget how to call it. Go race detector. So this isn't something you use all that often? No. I just always forget to do it. There it is, dash race. I guess that's not that hard to remember. But <laughs> <coughs> okay, and you go dash race. This is something you would use <coughs> not really sure, or you might have forgotten. Um, you I, have to know that there's this kind of uh, error before you use it? Uh, yeah, so this, this is, like I said, one of those things. So uh, there's a saying you go about, um, where, how does it go? Uh, share memory by communicating, don't communicate by sharing memory, something like that. And the idea is, don't write code like this, use channels. Okay? Don't share state between Go routines. If you want to communicate, do so over a channel. Channels are thread safe. And so you don't have to worry about this problem. So the issue is I'm communicating. Say I'm wanting to print five here. I'm communicating by modifying state. I should be using a channel. Okay. So basically the idea is that if I were using channels, I wouldn't have to worry about this problem. Um, uh, so let me add a test here. Well, I guess what I'm asking is if you had a complicated program and you had that error in it, you didn't realize you had the error, would it raise the Function catch it for you. Tell you. Uh, so the, the race detector will tell you. Probably. It's not 100%. There we go. Warning data race. So basically, the idea is that you just run the race detector on all your code all the time. And uh, it may catch anything that you wrote. Uh, write by go routine six, previous read by go routine five, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a really handy, oh, I've screwed up, like this is bad. And you go like look at line eight of that file and, and you can see what you did wrong, right? This is invalid and I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, I should be using channel, right? Uh, so that, that would be one way to fix this of uh, R, C, Chan, int. Um, and then I say go do all this stuff. And instead of saying x equal 5, I say c takes 5. And then, right, everybody remember channels, how they work? I'm sending this 5 onto the channel and pulling it off. So let me make sure that fixes our race, our data race. Oh, I didn't, you're right, I, I didn't make it, sorry. There we go, so it's passed. 
and the, the race detector didn't detect any races because there aren't any anymore. Okay. And then finally, I will show you, if you had to, for some reason, you could not use a channel, there's another way to fix this code. And that's to use a, a mutex, a lock. And the way that works is, you say mu.lock, and then you say mu.unlock, and then you say, You have this mutex. You lock it. You do what you need with the state. You unlock it. Down here, you lock it. You do what you need with the state. You unlock it. And the mutex does that stand for mutually exclusive? Yeah. All right. Who is your body? Huh? Not supposed to. Well, it's unpredictable what it would do. But what I'm saying is, if you, if you. Uh, because it, this may happen like down here. That's why it might print zero. Um, but what I'm saying is, if you have to modify shared state between multiple go routines, you've got to use a mutex. But in general, you should try not to do this. You should do this instead. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to say this is how you do all multi-threaded programming in a language like Java. If you forget to lock anywhere in your code, you have a bug, and it's the kind of bug that you will be unlikely to ever find. Because sometimes it works. Maybe most of the time it works. Maybe 99.9% .9 of the time it works. But then 0.1% of the time the program crashes. Okay? And that's why multi-threaded programming is so hard, because it's so easy to make a mistake. And that's why if you stick to channels, you're in better shape. Okay? That's cool. If you copy that up, thank you very much. All right, so that's testing. Everybody kind of get the idea here? So we're going to have uh, two, two things here. Uh, create a new package with the sum function we wrote last week. That's just the thing that adds all the numbers. Uh, and then create a sum test to test it. And you guys come up with cases for testing it and stuff. Uh, and then add a benchmark function to benchmark the sum function. Okay? Every call? It should be pretty easy. That's what we're working on right now.